In this video, we will study the pathology of renal cell carcinoma. Firstly, we will study its origin, risk factors and its types. Then we will study the pathogenesis and morphology of each of the types in details. So let's begin. Firstly, you need to learn that the origin of renal cell carcinoma is from renal tubular epithelium, as implied by the name renal cell carcinoma. Secondly, the risk factors for renal cell carcinoma are smoking and obesity. You know that these two factors are commonly the risk factors of many types of cancers. Now the third very surprising risk factor for renal cell carcinoma is hypertension. And it's quite surprising because hypertension is a vascular disorder. And logically a vascular disorder does not make sense to have association with the neoplastic disorder. But still this is considered as a risk factor. The fourth risk factor is exposure to a metal cadmium. And the last risk factor is acquired polycystic kidney disease that commonly occurs in patients who are on chronic dialysis. Those patients who are on chronic dialysis have tendency to develop multiple cysts on the kidney and along with the development of cysts, they may develop renal cell carcinomas. So the risk factors for renal cell carcinoma are smoking, obesity, hypertension, cadmium exposure and acquired polycystic kidney disease. Now based on the histopathological features, there are three types of renal cell carcinomas. First is clear cell carcinoma, second is papillary cell carcinoma and the third is chromophobe cell carcinoma. Out of all these types, clear cell carcinoma is the most common and chromophobe renal carcinoma is the least common. We will study each of these types in details. Now let's start with the clear cell carcinoma. Firstly, we will study its pathogenesis. So basically clear cell carcinoma occurs when there are mutations in VHL gene on chromosome number 3. VHL stands for von hippelden dau and this VHL gene is a tumor suppressor gene whose function is to suppress the formation of cancers. But when this tumor suppressor gene is itself mutated, there is tendency to develop clear cell carcinomas. Now let's study it in a little bit details. You know that in our cells there is pair of each chromosome and on each member of one pair of chromosome there are two corresponding alleles. So VHL gene is also in form of two alleles, one on each chromosome number 3. Now in clear cell carcinoma what happens is that one of the VHL allele undergoes deletion by some cytogenetic abnormalities and the other VHL gene at the VHL allele undergoes somatic mutation due to chemical carcinogens like cigarettes, chemicals or other carcinogenic elements. Or alternatively it may become silenced due to hypermethylation. Now when both copies of VHL alleles are inactivated this way that this loss of VHL results in increased production of HIF that is known as hypoxia inducible factor. Now this HIF or hypoxia inducible factor acts as a transcription factor and increases the transcription of vascular endothelial growth factor as well as other growth factors such as insulin growth factor 1. Now this vascular endothelial growth factor and other growth factors stimulate the growth of renal tubular cells which result in uncontrolled cell division. This uncontrolled cell division results in formation of clear cell carcinomas. So this is the pathogenesis of clear cell carcinomas. Let's review it once again. In clear cell carcinomas, there is mutation in VHL gene which results in increased formation of a transcription factor known as HIF. This hypoxia inducible factor or HIF increases the transcription of vascular endothelial growth factor and other growth factors. These growth factors provoke uncontrolled cell division resulting in clear cell carcinomas. Now here we also need to understand an additional point regarding von Hippel and Dow disease. This is an autosomal dominant trait in which one of the VHL gene is inherited as a germline mutation. So these people need only one additional mutation in the second allele to develop cancers. Resultantly, these patients are at increased risk of neoplasia. So if people with VHL disease who already have one mutated gene develop somatic mutations in the other genes in the cells of kidney, they develop clear cell carcinomas. And other than clear cell carcinomas, they are also at increased risk of developing multiple renal cysts hemangioblastomas of the cerebellum and retina and other variety of tumors. So people with VHL disease can develop all these tumors. Now let's come to the morphology of clear cell carcinomas. On gross specimen, clear cell carcinoma appears as a solitary mass. The word solitary means single. So instead of multiple masses, there is a single mass in clear cell carcinoma. Secondly, the cut surface of the tumor shows cystic areas or hemorrhage. Thirdly, this tumor has a very classical tendency to invade the renal veins. And when it invades the renal veins, the tumor grows as a solid column of cells that extend from renal vein into the inferior vena cava. Such extension into renal vein and then into inferior vena cava occurs in the serpentine fashion. Serpentine means snake. So the gross features are solitary mass whose cut surface shows cystic areas or hemorrhage 
and the tumor sometimes invades renal vein and grow as a solid column of cells in inferior vena cava. Now let's come to the microscopic features. For microscopic features we will mainly focus on three points that how do the cells look like, how do the cells arrange and how does the stroma surrounding the cells appear. So firstly as far as the cellular structure is concerned the cells in clear cell carcinoma do not stain eosinophilic rather they are clear in color with empty cytoplasm. Secondly along with these clear cells that have clear cytoplasm there are other type of cells that appear intensely eosinophilic and granular but these cells are very few most of the cells are those that are with clear cytoplasm. So you can see in this diagram where the cells do not appear eosinophilic rather they are with clear cytoplasm. Now secondly coming to the arrangement of the cells in clear cell carcinoma the cells are arranged in form of tubules or cords as you can see here in this diagram where the clear cells are in form of tubules but they can also be in form of cords. Now thirdly the stroma in cases of clear cell carcinoma is scanty but vascular which means that the stroma is not abundant because the cells are over proliferating so the relative amount of stroma remains very small that's why we call it as scanty. But even despite being scanty the stroma is highly vascular. This high vascularity corresponds to increased blood supply demand of the tumor cells. So on light microscopic picture of clear cell carcinomas you see clear cells with empty cytoplasm. You see few cells that are in density eosinophilic and granular and you see that the, that the cells are arranged in form of tubules or cords and you see stroma that is scanty but vascular. Now let's come to papillary renal cell carcinomas. Firstly we will study its pathogenesis. So papillary renal cell carcinomas are caused by activating mutations in MET proton gene on chromosome number 7. Now this MET proton gene encodes for receptor tyrosine kinase. So when there is activating mutation of MET proton gene, there will be increased activity of receptor tyrosine kinase which will cause uncontrolled cell division resulting in cancer. So the main point to learn here is that in papillary carcinomas the mutations in the MET proton gene on chromosome number 7. So the mutation is in MET proton gene on chromosome number 7. Now let's come to the morphology of papillary carcinomas. On gross specimen papillary renal cell carcinomas appear as bilateral or multiple masses which means that it can be present in both the kidneys and there can be multiple tumor masses instead of a solitary mass that we studied in clear cell carcinoma. This presence of multiple masses is a point of difference between clear cell carcinomas and papillary carcinomas. Secondly, in papillary carcinomas, similar to clear cell carcinoma, the cut surface will show cysts and hemorrhages. Now for microscopic features, the keyword to focus is papillary. The word papillary indicates that in this cancer, the light microscopic picture will show finger-like projections called papilla, which will be lined by proliferating neoplastic epithelial cells. Now let's come to the pathology of last type of renal cell carcinomas, that is chromophore renal cell carcinomas. These chromophore renal cell carcinomas arise from intercalated cells of collecting ducts and the unique feature about them is that they are caused not by mutations in one or few genes, rather they have multiple losses of entire chromosomes. This deficiency of multiple chromosomes is known as extreme hypoploidy. So remember this point that extreme hypoploidy is a feature of chromophore renal carcinomas. Now let's move to the morphology. On gross specimen, chromophore renal cell carcinomas appear as tan brown masses, tan brown masses. For microscopic features, the mnemonic to remember is P, P, P or triple P. Out of these three P's, the first P stands for pale staining cytoplasm. So that's why it is called as chromophobe. Chromo means color and phobe means hating or resisting. As this tumor stains lightly eosinophilic, that's why we call it as chromophobe. But this cytoplasm is not totally clear like clear cell carcinomas. It just stains lightly eosinophilic. The second P stands for perinuclear clearing. So what does it mean? You remember that we have just studied that in chromophore renal cell carcinomas, the cytoplasm stains lightly eosinophilic. But just around the nucleus, there is a central zone where, it's, where instead of light eosinophilic staining, there is completely colorless or clear zone. You can see here in this diagram that there is a clear area just around the nucleus. This clear zone around the nucleus is in form of ring and is known as perinuclear clearing. Now the third P stands for prominent cell membranes. So the cell membranes of this tumor appear very distinct with prominent margins. So overall you will see pale cytoplasm, you will see perinuclear clearing and you will see prominent cell membranes. Now let's discuss the clinical features of all renal cell carcinomas. We will divide clinical features into renal manifestations and extra renal manifestations. As far as the renal manifestations are concerned, there is a classical triad for clinical features of renal cell carcinoma. 
This triad includes palpable mass, flank pain, and hematuria. Palpable mass, flank pain, and hematuria. Now this sounds logical because when a tumor is growing from the kidney, it will appear as a palpable mass in the abdomen. Secondly, as the tumor of the kidney grows, it will stretch the capsule of the kidney. This stimulates the pain receptors in the capsule resulting in localized flank pain. Thirdly, as the tumor cells invade surrounding vascular stroma, this invasion will cause leakage of blood into urinary system. This leakage of blood is called hematuria. So the classical triad consists of palpable mass, flank pain and hematuria. Now the extra renal manifestations are in the form of paraneoplastic syndromes. These paraneoplastic syndromes are in form of polycythemia that is caused by secretion of erythropoietin by tumor cells. Cushing syndrome that is caused by secretion of ACTH like substances by tumor cells and hypercalcemia that is caused by secretion of parathyroid hormone related protein by the tumor cells. So the extra renal manifestation or paraneoplastic syndromes in renal cell carcinomas are polycythemia, Cushing syndrome and hypercalcemia. Now the last point is that you know all the cancers have a tendency to metastasize to other distant organs. So the common sites of metastasis in renal cell carcinomas are lungs and bones. Lungs and bones. So this concludes our discussion on renal cell carcinomas.